few introductions just to know who's in the room. Because uh, that's so important. When we're talking about debates or, or points of view and values, it's really important to know who you're talking to, who is your audience. And relationship is very important. So one of the things that I've learned over the years of doing debates and community events is that uh, from basically from First Nations is the introduction is really important. So who you are, where you're from, who your family is, how you're related to the, the place that you are in, and that eventually, and as we are here now, that you represent. So I represent a specific geography. Uh, I grew up uh, in the Tri-City area. I, I was uh, born in New Westminster, but uh, the rest of my life lived in Port Moody and Coquitlam, briefly in Port Coquitlam. And went to Port Moody Senior, and uh, then went over to UVic, and got a philosophy degree, and I was thinking of going into law, but I got on a waiting list at UBC, law, but didn't get it. So then I had to change my path, and I chose the path of education, and that's really where I've I've been for a while. And the reason that I did that, and I'll just give you a little bit of background as it relates to my story and then uh, as it gets into how I became a member of parliament and how that's relevant to debate, discussion, and this conference. And so once I, I decided, okay, education is my path, the concern that I had through university and growing up is I saw this amazing place that we have in British Columbia changing, changing not for the better. I saw the impacts to our environment, diminishing the biodiversity, the incredible things that we have in the province, and I wanted to change that. So because I was in sports, I was a swimmer, I took my passion, of, or my skills of swimming and my passion for the environment that I've developed, and I combined the two, and I started swimming for the environment. So I did my first swim across Georgia Strait, does everyone know where George Strait is? Have you, has, uh, who's been uh, on a ferry to Vancouver Island? Okay, anyone with their hand up has crossed George Strait. So it's the body of water separating Vancouver Island and the mainland. And I crossed the narrowest point, so 35 kilometers, and I did that swimming one day in 1990. Well, that swim started to change my life. I went on to do four more swims across Georgia Strait, once across Juan de Fuca Strait, which is between Vancouver Island and Port Angeles, Washington. And then I did another swim in 1995 that absolutely changed my life, and that was swimming the length of the Fraser River. And I had realized by then, or once I finished the swim, that changed my life. And I could talk to you a lot about that swim. In fact, for six years I did nothing but that, went into schools, talked to over 55,000 people, mostly students, in, in 150 different communities in BC. And, but I'm not, I'm only have a few minutes here with you. So I was hoping to share briefly that background, why that was important, and, and explain about uh, my work as an MP. And that swim changed my life in terms of at the end of it, I got asked to get into politics. And I was wondering why, why would people be interested in what I had to say? Well, by then I'd already developed a very sharp message. I had already shown determination that I had a goal, that I was able to complete that goal. Swimming 1,400 kilometers down BC's longest river was no small order. <clears throat> it took three weeks. It was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life, but I completed it. And we had over 120 articles in, in local papers and regional papers and national papers. Uh, it was on TV, radio, and I had to get rid of those, those fears of public speaking and, <clears throat> and, and try and get a little, improve those and communicate a message. And that's not easy. But I became comfortable with that and eventually started doing that more and more, and that's why I started to get asked to run for leadership in my community. I, I said no for six years, but eventually, 
in 2002, I said yes, and I ran for city council. That seven years on city council went from 2002, ran three in three elections, uh, to 2009, was fundamental, and it, it was the base for my learning about procedure and policy, how, how laws are made or bylaws at the local level, and just learning politics. It's a great way for anyone interested in getting into politics, uh, city council, the school board, those are, you know, and, and university uh, student bodies, they're great ways to get involved in the process. This is a great way to start learning and getting involved in the process of making change, of making your community, your province, or your country a better place. And again, it starts with, I go back to the opening, it starts with building relationships, knowing who you're talking to, knowing what their interests are, and knowing how we can find common ground. Because in the end, that's, I think, how we're going to make the most change, is finding that common ground around those concerns. I'm very concerned about how we're changing the planet. I think the largest crisis on our, of our time, climate change, is going to be a very, very tough challenge for future generations to figure out. I think past generations have left a huge challenge for, for folks like you. And certainly the global community has to come together to deal with this issue. So that's one, how, one major issue, and there's so many, whether it's poverty, uh, whether it's uh, uh, injustice, uh, inequity, there's so many issues out there that need our attention, whether it's locally or globally. So essentially, when I finished my, my term as a city councillor, I was then asked to run federally. And I was, again, going, whoa, what do I know about federal politics? But I was interested. So I ran in a by-election in 2009, and I was elected. And I've been successful in running again in 2011, and then just last year, 2015. So my political career, I've run in six elections. I've been elected in all of those. I've gone from local to federal, and it all started with the passion of swimming uh, that, that I started when I was a young person, right? And I went right through uh, to university. So I took a skill that I had and developed it. I combined it with the passion. And that led me to where I am now. So I'm a member of parliament. I represent, uh, as I mentioned, Fort Moody Coquitlam. I'm with the political party is the New Democrat Party, which I feel best represents my views, concerned about people, concerned about the environment, and making a difference, making a better community, from a, a perspective of inclusion including everybody, so that everybody's heard. So democracy is, is a critical value um, that I, I feel is really important in terms of decision making. So the way we make decisions and then the type of decisions we make. So uh, I, just to give you a specific uh, example, and I've said this at other, uh, other youth leadership uh, conferences and use this example of, um, because again, we don't, I don't have a lot of time to explain a number of the bills that I brought forward, but I want to share with you one. And that was uh, a shark fin bill. Um, I'm the critic for fisheries, oceans, and Canadian Coast Guard. So my concerns look at all the, the watersheds and the fisheries uh, on both coasts, all three coasts actually. Um, the Great Lakes, freshwater fishery, and our oceans and protecting our oceans. And I, in 2012, I read a report about the state of the world's oceans. And I found out that we are fishing out all the major fish species in a huge way. So we're losing top predators very quickly. Sharks were in dramatic decline in many, many species of sharks. So I thought, well, what's that got to do with Canada? How can Canada play a role? Well, no country had passed a law saying that they were going to deal with the importation or, or 
or the problem of shark finning. And that, what, that was what was driving the issue of the loss of sharks in our oceans. And sharks play a, a fundamental role of maintaining a healthy ecosystem and the balance in our, in our oceans. And that to me was, okay, I, I can do something about that. And I proposed a private member's bill to ban the importation of shark fins into Canada. And if one country, if we became the first country to do that, we could set an example to the rest of the world that they they need to do that. In fact, we were hoping that Europe and then China, or sorry, um, the United States would be able to uh, would also consider similar legislation. Now, the, the the big issue is in China. That's where we know is 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 driving the consumption of shark fins. So Canada is a very small player in the consumption of shark fins. However, we could be a big player in setting an example of how we steward our oceans. So that's one of the reasons that I chose this issue. Uh, now, I also got asked, well, is this a, a cultural thing? Is this a, a racial thing? And I said, absolutely not. And in fact, I work with a lot of young Chinese Canadians, specifically, who were very concerned about this because what their perspective was, which is similar to mine, so I found common ground, um, is that uh, it does not add value to, nutritional value to what they're eating. It is very much a status symbol to eat shark fin soup. And what I didn't realize is over 100 million sharks a year are being slaughtered for their fins, specifically for their fins, for essentially shark fin soup. And so the bill that I proposed was to ban the importation. So in other words, you couldn't bring it into the country if this legislation passed. So I did a campaign for over a year. Uh, long story short, it worked very, very well, got lots of attention, worked with a number of organizations. Municipalities started to pass bylaws because they were also concerned. And it came to a vote in 2013. I lost by five votes. So it was really close. Uh, and it was a conservative dominated government at the time, so we had a conservative majority. And I knew I had to get a number of conservative MPs on board. I managed to get three on board, but I needed three more to win. I only needed six because I had all the op other opposition members, so all the NDP, all the Liberals, all the, um, well, the, there was two Green Party and the Bloc and some independents. I'm all on board and three conservatives. I needed three more to pass it to get it to the next stage. However, you can say, well, that was a failure. I didn't win the vote. But it was, I think, a huge success in that it raised a lot of awareness. Now in this parliament, we have a young MP, a liberal MP, who is trying to pass the same legislation. He's essentially adopted my legislation, and he's now trying to put it through in a private member's bill. So that, that is just an example of taking an issue and trying to make change. And the thing is, if you aren't successful at getting what you want through, whether it's through debate or a discussion, you have to keep trying. You have to show persistence. You have to be creative. If you can't get it the first time, maybe there's a second, there's another way that you can do make change and make essentially get that uh, legislation uh, in, introduced and, and uh, in place, implemented, or the change that you want to see happen in practice or policy. But it's tough. If you just took this room here and we said one issue and, and made one proposition, I bet we would have at least three, four, maybe five different approaches proposals of how we make change or how we deal with that issue, it's not easy. But if you come together, if you have dialogue, if you have clear debate, if you listen to the reasons for and against doing something, it'll influence you. You can make decisions based on that information. Factual information is critically important for making good decisions. So those 
those elements are, are important to a debate or a discussion for decision making. So uh, I, I want to leave a little bit of time for a couple of questions. Um, and I, I just wanted to share a little bit of uh, insight about how the local uh, activities or events or things that I've done uh, led to essentially my global work. So the, the swims that I did, you know, I mentioned Georgia Strait. You know, there's, there's sharks in our waters, believe it or not, in Canada. People, a lot of people don't realize that. And already I was working on the oceans at a young age. Then I got into local politics, then into federal politics. As opportunities arose, I became a, the fisheries and oceans critic. And I started working on the, the care of our stewarding of our oceans. So it's funny how things come full circle, how you can make change. I never, you know, I talked about education. Well, I did education, and I feel I'm still doing education. Um, I, I did that as the executive director for 13 years of, of an organization I formed called the Rivershed Society. And I'm still volunteering as the chair of the society and I started in education and I got involved in politics and policy and changing the public policy so it's it's uh, you never know where where the work that you can do in your community will take you one of the things that and I'll finish with this that's really critical is knowing what your passion is having a very clear idea about what it is that you're passionate about. And that can change. That can change over your, the, the span of your life. But the more you know what your passion is, and the more you're focused and you're driven and you're determined to make change, the more you'll be successful or you'll have an opportunity to succeed. And remember, don't be afraid of failure or of taking risks because that is critical. I mentioned I was a swimmer. I was uh, top in my age in the country by the time I was 14 in my event, 1500 meter freestyle. So I was the best in Canada. I lost more events, more swims than I won. And that shaped who I am. Because when you lose, it's how you deal with it. And it's how, for me, it was coming back, getting more involved, getting back, uh, trying harder, trying to improve myself. Uh, I would always congratulate the people I swam with, my teammates, my competitors, and in a way that it was trying to improve, I always looked at it as trying to improve myself. So it's how you approach things, what you get out of uh, the passion or the issue that you're changing, or trying to change, make change. And again, scale is important too. Getting some experience at the local level is critical because as I was mentioning at the beginning, finding out who your audience is, knowing what they what they care about is only going to be help is only going to help you to make change at a international or global level, like the United Nations level. So how many people, just as a curiosity, how many people have been involved in an election before of any kind. Okay. Can you give me an example of what the election was? Um, I'm actually currently involved in um, my local MLA's election campaign. Oh, right on. Yeah. Okay. And his campaign just started. other examples of elections? And they could be elections as well as municipal elections that are just as important. Um, I was involved in the OCA for the Citizens right. Association, so I'm um, helping them with um, their office tasks as well as um, campaigning for our community. Has anyone run for office of any sort, a student body, student leadership? Yeah. yeah? What was that experience like? 
it was pretty cool. You got to, you had to garner support from a lot of people. You had to go talk to people and try and you know, put your cause out there. So it was challenging, but fun at the same time. Were you successful? Uh, yeah, it was. Right on. So what sort of techniques did you find worked for you? How did you talk to other people? How did you get them on side? I guess asking a lot of questions. You had to find out what people really cared about and then try and fix your, uh, or, uh, make your point or make your uh, spiel uh, kind of on their side. You know? Right. Because if you're way off base from what they want, they're not going to support what you're talking about. But if you can influence or, or uh, educate them, to come around, you'll get supporters. And then what I think you find is once you get supporters, you're now showing leadership. You're now representing those who are supporting you. You take that first step, and that's really important, no matter what it is. It it's, can be very scary, it can be very intimidating. It could even be as, as uh, intimidating about public speaking which is a lot of people have a big fear of public speaking. But once you get over it, once you try it, once you find out that the fears of failure or what could go wrong aren't so bad, you become more comfortable, you become more confident, and then you can go on to do other things. So any questions about what I've said so far that come to mind about my experience as a parliamentarian, which I went over quite quickly, or as a city councillor, or my community work. So how, how did you get people on your side, and get people to support when you stood for your uh, elections? The, uh, so I'll go back into my, uh, the swims, because that was fundamental in really putting it out there who I was. And I mentioned that I, I got in the news quite a bit, so people, I developed profiles. And there's, there's two ways I think you can get elected. One is profile, so people know who you are. Or the other is just really hard work. I was able to do both, but at one point, I had profile. So I had people coming to me saying, we want you to run. So I developed those supporters quite quickly. And the first thing I did is once I decided, because that was six years later, I decided to actually run is I got a team together to help. So I got a team of like-minded supporters together to help address a number of the issues. So I'd already used a lot of the skills that I had as a community activist, somebody who was working on developing issues in the community. I used those skills in politics, and I developed that team. And then we did an assessment of what are the main issues in our community. So we, we broke it down because I wanted to run on the on the theme of a sustainable Coquitlam, we made the, th the top three issues, one in social, one in economic, and one in environmental. And we ran on those. And I explained that we need a council who will reflect uh, or move us toward a sustainable Coquitlam. And a lot of people were like, what's sustainable? What does that mean? Because this is back in 2002. And not a lot of people were even talking about that at the local level in Coquitlam. So I had a lot of questions about it, and so I found I had to explain. Well, it means a healthy environment. We need trees, we need healthy streams, we need salmon populations. We need communities that are fair and democratic. We need decision-making that's representative of the people. We need issues that are listened to. We need a council that will listen to people and their concerns. And we need a local community, or a local economy that works for people so that they're able to provide the kind of uh, income and, and sources of revenue for their families to make a difference, so jobs. So I talked about those essentially three elements of, of a sustainable Coquitlam, which became my platform, and people really related to that. So I initially, I got elected, and it was it's hard always to run on your first time and get elected, which I did, I was fifth. And then the next election in 2005, I talked with polls, because I was really dealing with the issue of development. In, in the community, it was how quickly do we develop? In Coquitlam, you'll know, uh, when I was on council, Burke Mountain was only one acre parcels, and that's it. 
and Westwood Plateau was just finishing its phases. So I, I had grown up when Westwood Plateau was all forest, or forested mountainside. So within, since 1980 to 2005, roughly 10, that phasing of, of Westwood Plateau completely changed from wildlife to human habitat. Then the issue was Burke, and how does Burke develop? Whether it's, is it going to be green development, or is it going to just mow all the trees down and go build right up to the streams? That became an issue. And then again, I moved on to federal, and a whole set of different issues uh, to run federally. So that hopefully gives you a little bit of insight. Any other questions? How did you go into swimming to intensely enhance your skills in swimming, or was it more of a hobby that turned into a competition? Yeah, I, I was, when I grew up, uh, we had a pool in our backyard, and my brother and I swam, we played soccer, we did all sorts of sports. So I, you know, I did soccer, baseball, swimming, volleyball, um, you name it, football. And what I started to really get interested in swimming by the time I was probably uh, eight or nine. And then, uh, so I started to, I, go, I went into winter, what's called winter swimming, when I turned 14. So then I had to choose, and that was the only sport I did. So all the other sports um, were set aside to focus in on swimming. And then I, I swam from 14 to 21. So a seven, seven year career that, that way. But, um, and it, you know, I mean, it, it can be anything that you have. So it, you know, I, I went in because it was, I guess, a bit of a, well, my parents put me in for safety. They didn't want me drowning in the pool. And then I liked it, so it became a hobby. Then I became good at it, so it became a skill. And then I went on and really excelled in it. And then I took it to a new level when I combined, after university, when I got my degree and I learned a, a lot about the concerns in the world, that, you know, the, what we're doing to the planet, and I combined it with my passion. And so for a decade, I did these environmental marathon swims. So from 1990 to 2000, I did 14 environmental marathon swims across Georgia Strait, Juan de Fuca Strait, twice the length of the Fraser River. I did Quinell Lake, Pitt Lake, Williams Lake, the Roush River, and the Lower Fraser. So those were, I've really focused on the Fraser River Basin, which is the largest river, river basin uh, in BC, and it's where most of the province lives. It's, the, it's a huge landmass in, in the province. It has 10 of BC's 14 biogeochromatic zones, so it's very diverse. It has a lot of history, uh, not only European history, Simon Fraser and the Gold Rush and all the development that came as a result of that, but thousands of years of First Nation history. So it's an incredible river, and it's an incredible place, and it represents, I think, incredible challenges. So that's something where I think my swimming will take me to continue for the rest of my life, is to working on this area. And I'm just gonna finish on this note that when I, you know, when I, I, uh, I got out of university, I thought, I wanna change the world, because there's problems in the world. And then I thought, whoa, the world's a big place. So I started thinking, well, how about scaling it down? Well, let's just focus, I'll just focus my efforts on Canada. And then as I went, you know, I went through some of the ideas of trying to make change, national issues. I said, wow, Canada's a huge place. So then I said, well, what about just my home province, British Columbia? And then I started working on BC. We formed the Rivershed Society of BC. But then, I, as I was really starting to work on that, I was thinking, wow, BC is huge too. So I looked at, and I developed a focus on rivers and watersheds, and it was the Fraser that pulled me in and I started to work on. It's the largest and most productive salmon river in the world, and it, is, it has been on BC's most endangered rivers list. For years. So I thought that's, and it goes right through my hometown of Coquitlam. So that's, 
that's a focal point. So I'm right now focused on the Fraser River Basin, which is a quarter of the size of BC, and I still think that's huge. There's so many different communities along, along the river, within the Fraser River. The challenges are, are big. I've been focused on, on a leadership program called the Sustainable Living Leadership Program. We've run for 13 years. If anyone is interested in taking that program, and it goes every summer, you travel the length of the river by canoe, raft, and canoe. It's an awesome program. It's life-changing. Talk to Ravi. He'll give you more information about how you can find out about it. And I know other uh, individuals in, in Ravi's leadership conferences have uh, taken a look at it. It's, it's interesting. As well, um, we've had individuals uh, volunteering at my office. Because just like getting involved in a campaign, getting involved with an elected official is a great way to get experience. Not only is it a good experience for you as an individual, but you can put that on your resume as well. And that will help send a message to others who are looking about who you are, your profile, and what you're all about. So keep that in mind as well.